Are you someone who has downloaded Blender, watched a few tutorials, tried to model something, but all you really accomplished was... ...deleting the default cube? Well, this video is for you. If you have a very basic understanding of Blender or you need a refresher, this Blender Crash Course will get you up to speed on the most fundamental 3D modeling basics in Blender in around 8 to 10 minutes. Usually, this would be several videos worth of content, but this is a crash course. It's going to be fast, informative, and a bit chaotic. If you want to skip ahead to certain parts, there are chapters in the video timeline and timestamps in the description. All right, let's get started. Hello, welcome to my Blender Crash Course. So you can left click to select objects. You can drag left click to select a group of objects and press X to delete them. Control Z to undo. Press down on the middle mouse button and drag to orbit the camera. You can hold shift and drag with the middle mouse button to pan the camera. Use the scroll wheel to zoom. Okay, now delete everything. Shift A to create an object. Make a cube. Now you're a true Blender user. After selecting an object, you can press G to move it, left click to confirm the location, right click to cancel. After pressing G, you can press X, Y, or Z to constrain your movements to those axes. You can press S to scale objects, left click to confirm, right click to cancel. You can also constrain them to whatever axis. Same thing goes with pressing R to rotate objects, and you can also constrain them. If your object is not aligned to the world axis, like you rotated it a little bit or something like that, you can double tap X, Y, or Z to constrain transformations to an object's local axis. An object's local axis is an object's personal coordinate space, whereas the global axis is an object's position, rotation, and scale relative to the global X, Y, Z coordinates. On the top of the 3D viewport, you can click the drop-down menu here to switch to local transformation mode, which will make all of your transform operations like moving, rotating, and scaling relative to the local coordinates whenever you press X, Y, or Z, but just stick to global coordinates for now. You can press N and then navigate over to the item tab to see an object's transform properties relative to the global coordinates. From here, you can also manually enter in values for an object's transform properties, like its position, rotation, and scale. Alternatively, instead of typing in a value into the item menu, you can type in a value while you're transforming an object after you've picked an axis. For example, pressing S to scale and then Y to constrain to the Y axis and then typing in five will scale the cube by five on the Y axis. The same thing can be applied to moving and rotating as well for more precise modeling. You can press tab to toggle into edit mode. You'll know what mode you're in if you look at the top left of your screen. By default, you'll be in vertex selection mode, or you can press one to enter vertex selection mode. And in that mode, you can manipulate vertices. You can move, scale, and rotate a vertex or a group of vertices, just like you would anything else. You can press two to enter edge selection mode and manipulate edges. It's the same as moving two vertices at once. Similarly, you can move, rotate, and scale them. Press three for face selection mode to manipulate faces. Just like with vertices and edges, you can move, scale, and rotate a face with the same controls as an object mode. As well as moving them around, you can delete vertices, edges, and faces by pressing X exactly the same way as deleting things in object mode. Pressing X in edit mode will bring up the deletion menu, which will allow you to choose various options for deleting geometry, like vertices, edges, or faces. Dissolving will try to remove the selection without creating holes in the geometry. Just like how you can delete objects with X in edit mode, like in object mode, you can also create meshes in edit mode using Shift A. This creates a new geometry that is part of the same object. This means that in object mode, all the geometry will be treated as the same object, with modifiers and other object-specific settings applying to the whole thing, no matter how disconnected the geometry is. In edit mode, you can press L to select linked, which by default will select all connected vertices, faces, and edges, allowing you to select specific enclosed meshes that are a part of your object. Additionally, pressing A in edit mode will select all the geometry of an object. Pressing A outside of edit mode in object mode will select everything in the scene, with the primary selection being highlighted in light orange. In edit mode, you can create loop cuts by pressing Ctrl R and hovering over an edge. Pressing right click will snap a loop cut to an edge's center. Pressing left click will allow you to slide the loop cut wherever you want, and then pressing again will confirm it. After pressing Ctrl R, you can use the scroll wheel to increase the amount of loop cuts that you make. With a face selected, you can press E to extrude a face. You can press left click to confirm the location of extrusion, or you can press right click to snap the extrusion back to the original face it was extruded from. Keep in mind this does not cancel the extrusion, it merely just puts the extruded face right on top of the face that you chose before, so they'll be layered on top of each other. Extrusions will usually be perpendicular to the face that you've selected. If you have multiple faces selected, it'll try and average out the normal between the two faces. Just by making loop cuts and extruding faces, you can already make some pretty interesting geometry. You can also extrude faces inwards, however extruding an isolated face inwards can create bad geometry. In edge selection mode, you can click on an edge and press Ctrl B to bevel it. Left click to confirm, right click to cancel. Similar to creating edge loops, after pressing Ctrl B, you can use the scroll wheel to increase the amount of bevel geometry. With a face selected, you can press I to inset a face, left click to confirm, right click to cancel. Additionally, with a face selected, you can press Ctrl B to bevel all edges of a face. In either edge selection or face selection mode, you can Alt click to select an existing edge loop or a face loop. Edge and face loops are connected faces or edges that follow the same latitude or longitude of a mesh. Normally, face loops are composed of faces that have four edges and have their opposing edges joined end to end in order to count as a loop. Alt clicking an edge or a face not connected to a completed edge or a face loop will result in selecting the longest chain of viable edges or faces. Alt clicking is very useful for quickly selecting rings of faces or loops created by loop cuts, insets, and bevels. 
While you're working, if you want to change your viewport display mode, you can press and hold Z. This lets you choose from solid view, rendered view, material preview view, and wireframe view. Additionally, you can press Alt Z to enter ghosted view or Shift Z to directly enter wireframe view. A common issue that beginners come across is moving objects in edit mode without considering the object origin or the true position, rotation, and scale of an object in object mode. This leads to things like weird pivot points and objects scaling from points outside of their geometry. This is because an object's origin remains at the location it was created. You can press right-click to bring up the object menu to set the origin point of an object. The most common ones used by beginners are origin to geometry and geometry to origin. When you create an object, it spawns at the 3D cursor, which by default is at the world origin. If you want to move your 3D cursor, shift right-click anywhere in the 3D viewport to change its location. You can even place it on top of other objects. You can press Shift S to bring up the selection menu in both edit mode or object mode. This gives you a bunch of options to snap your 3D cursor to. Additionally, you can set the origin of an object to the 3D cursor's location for custom pivot points if you want your object to move, rotate, or scale in a specific way. In object mode, you can press Shift D to duplicate an object. This creates a copy of an object that follows your cursor. You can press X, Y, or Z to constrain its position to an axis. Then you can press left click to confirm its location or right click to snap it back to its original position. You can also press Alt-D to create an instance duplicate of an object, meaning that the object data is linked. Whatever edits you make to one object, all other instance duplicates will be edited in the same way. This can get confusing at times, so for most purposes, just use Shift-D. You can access modifiers by clicking the blue wrench on the right. Most of the classic modifiers are found in the Generate menu. Modifiers can get very complicated, so I'll just cover three for this tutorial. One of the most commonly used modifiers is the Mirror modifier. It mirrors the geometry along whatever axis or axis you choose. You can check the clipping option if you want the geometry to merge vertexes where it's being mirrored. Most people delete geometry on the side that is not being reflected to avoid weird intersections and bad geometry later on. The mirror modifier is one of the most useful modifiers and it makes modeling symmetrical objects much easier. Additionally, you can mirror objects around other objects. Just be careful when moving the object about which other objects are mirrored as it could throw off where the reflected objects are located. Another very important modifier is the Subdivision Surface Modifier, or SubD or Subsurf for short. It subdivides your geometry and makes it a bit blobby. You can increase the amount of subdivisions for a higher resolution. You can also control the Subsurf geometry by adding loop cuts and sliding them closer to the corners and edges. The Subdivision Surface Modifier increases the detail of the curvature of geometry. It is very important for high poly models and is used in both hard surface and organic modeling. Another commonly used modifier is the bevel modifier, mostly by hard surface modelers. You can increase the amount of segments to increase the resolution. It bevels all the outer edges of an object procedurally, so you can use this as an alternative to pressing Ctrl B on a lot of edges. There are a lot of modifiers that Blender can offer. Some are very useful in general, others are very niche. Although I've only showed the three most relevant modifiers for beginners, I suggest you research and experiment with the rest of the modifiers as you get more familiar with Blender. Modifiers can be stacked. Even the same modifier can be stacked on an object multiple times. Modifiers are ordered from top to bottom, the bottom modifier applying last. This means that the order in which you stack modifiers can drastically change the final output of an object. By default, all objects will appear flat or faceted. To shade them smooth, you can open the right-click menu to choose a shading option. Shading smooth will smoothen out round objects, but will make rectilinear or flat objects appear strange. To fix this, there's an option called Shade Smooth by Angle, which is what most people use by default. The type of shading an object has affects how it will be rendered, which is where materials come in. The material panel in Blender is very complex, and you can create a lot of cool shaders in the Shader Node Editor. But for simplicity, I'm going to stick with the default principle BSDF material. The Material Properties tab is the checkered red circle on the right, close to where the Modifier tab is. By default, there's a standard principle BSDF material, which is Blender's standard PBR material. You can change the properties like color, but nothing will show unless you're in the rendered or material preview display modes. You can rename materials to keep them organized. To add new materials, click on the plus icon on the right side of the material list. You can then create a new material by pressing the new button, or choose an existing material by pressing the small dropdown next to the button. To assign multiple materials to the same object, simply select faces or geometry in edit mode. Click on your chosen material in the material list, and then press assign. For now, you should have enough information to start modeling some basic stuff. There's a lot more that Blender can offer that I haven't even touched on, like rendering, UV unwrapping, the shader node tree, geometry nodes, particle systems, simulation nodes, texture painting, sculpting, rigging, animating, and much more. And yeah, I get it. This crash course was super fast and probably a lot to take in. So let me show you how easy it is to get into Blender and let's model something super simple together in five minutes. We're going to be modeling this simple robot. In order to follow along smoothly, the most essential things to know are Navigating in 3D with the mouse like orbiting, zooming, and panning. Creating things in both object mode and edit mode with Shift A and deleting them with X. Moving objects around with G, scaling objects with S, and rotating them with R. Going into edit mode and manipulating vertices, edges, and faces by moving, scaling, or rotating them. Creating loop cuts and extrusions, as well as bevels and insets in edit mode. Feel free to pause or slow down the video if you want. I'm going to be going at real-time speed. Let's start by creating a cube with the Shift-A menu. Then, I'll press Tab to go into edit mode and press Control r to create a loop cut and right-click to center it. I'll switch into wireframe mode by pressing Z and selecting wireframe view on the left. Then, in face selection mode, I'll drag select to select and delete the right half of the cube. 
Now I'll mirror the cube over to X axis by going back into object mode and then going to the modifiers tab and adding the mirror modifier. Now I'll switch to edit mode, go to edge selection mode by pressing 2 and then select the bottom edge and move it on the X axis. Now I'll switch to face selection mode by pressing 3 and then select the top face then bevel it by pressing Control B. To finish roughing out the robot's torso, I'll select the bottom face and scale it on the Y axis. Now I'll go back up to the top face and extrude the top face downwards. Make sure to have flipping enabled on the mirror modifier properties to get it to work right. After extruding the face downwards, I'll scale and reposition it a bit before moving on to adding some detail to the torso. I'll create two loop cuts on the left side of the torso by hovering over a horizontal edge and pressing Ctrl R, scrolling up with the mouse wheel and then right clicking. I'm going to add another horizontal loop cut before extruding the top two middle faces by pressing E to create the small side panels. Then I'll make a couple more vertical loop cuts on the front face for the extrusions on the bottom where the wheel will attach to. Now I'll move back up to the top of the body and select some of the top faces and extrude them downwards to create a little hole. I'll also scale it on the y-axis to add more angles and implied complexity. Now in object mode, I'll press shift A to bring up the create menu and make a cylinder. I'll then rotate the cylinder 90 degrees on the x-axis by pressing R, X, and then typing in 90. I'll then move the head to its correct position before going into edit mode and adjusting its shape. I'll select the front face and press I to inset it a little, and then I'll extrude it outward and scale it down to create a cone shape. I'll repeat the process of insetting and extruding a few times arbitrarily to create some complexity. Finally, I'll bevel the innermost face with Control b and then rounding out the bevel by using the scroll wheel before I left click. Now with the shape of the head coming together, I'll switch back into object mode and reposition and scale the head until I'm happy. Then in object mode, I'll press Shift A to make another cube for the neck and then I'll scale it down before I edit its shape. Then in edit mode, I'll press A to select all the cube's geometry, rotate it on the X axis with R and then I'll start loop cutting and extruding. I'm just going to make some arbitrary loop cuts and extrusions since the neck won't be too visible, but you can add as much detail as you want. After I'm done with the neck, I'll go back into object mode and press Shift A to create another cylinder for the wheel. This time I'll rotate it to be perpendicular to the head, so I'll press R, then Y, then 90. I'm then scaling it down on the X axis by pressing S and then X to get it to look like a wheel, and then scaling it down and putting it in the correct position. I'm going to mirror the wheel the same way I mirrored the main body by going into edit mode, pressing Ctrl R to make a loop cut, and then right clicking to center the loop cut. Then I'm going to go into wireframe mode and delete the right side. Now I'll mirror it by adding the mirror modifier, but this time mirroring over the z-axis. This is because we rotated the cylinder onto its side, making its local z-axis point left and right. The mirror modifier applies to an object's local axis, not the global axis. After mirroring, I'll enter edit mode. Here I'm extruding out the side face and scaling it down to make a beveled wheel shape. Now I'm going to go back and edit the body so that the little rectangular extrusions on the bottom now extend to the middle of the wheel. I'll also select and move the bottom edge along the x-axis to create more angles and bevels. I'll adjust the location of the wheel and continue extruding more parts of the body until I'm satisfied with how the lower portion looks. Now that most of the essential shapes are mostly finished, I'll start adding some smaller objects to create some detail. I'll start by making the axle to this wheel, which is a simple cylinder. To create the axle centered on the wheel, I'll select the wheel, press Shift S, and then select Cursor to select it to center my 3D cursor on the wheel. Now I can press Shift A to open the Create menu and add a cylinder that's centered on the wheel. I'll rotate it on the Y axis to be parallel to the wheel by pressing R, Y, and then typing in 90. I'll then scale it down to an appropriate size and then scale again on the X axis to create an axle that sticks out on the sides. Now I'm going to add some extra detail by beveling the bottom edge of the main body. I'll select the relevant edges and then press Ctrl B and scroll up to create a rounded bevel. I'm also going to add a couple more random loop cuts and extrude some faces in or out to create more variation on the body's surface. Similarly, I'm going to bevel the back of the head to make it look more interesting. I'll spend a minute going around and adding more loop cuts and extrusions until I'm satisfied before finally polishing everything up and adding materials. The way I like to finalize or polish up hard surface objects is to add a slight bevel on everything with the bevel modifier. After adding the bevel modifier, I'll increase the segments up to 3, and then hold shift as I drag left and right on the bevel amount to finally dial in the amount of bevel I want. I'll repeat this process for every object in the scene, and I'll also add auto smoothing by right clicking and selecting shade smooth by angle on every object. I'll just realize that the auto smoothing and beveling has made the wheel look a bit strange. So I'll take the opportunity to work on the wheel a bit more and inset the side face and extrude it inwards to create more detail. Since I worked on the wheel, I've decided to also start adding detail elsewhere, like another cylinder on the top portion of the body. If you want, you should take the time to keep adding extrusions or new shapes to the robot to make it your own. Now that most of the model is done, it's time to add materials. I'll start by switching the viewport to material preview mode by holding down Z and dragging downwards. I'll then select the head and create a new material in the material tab. I'll keep things simple by just sticking with the default principle BSDF material and rename it to keep things organized. I'll also change the color to blue. 
I'll then apply the same material to the torso by selecting it, then clicking the small drop down menu next to the new material button to select my existing blue material. I'll also create new materials for the wheel tire and other objects like the neck and axle. I'll adjust the color, roughness, metalness, and other settings until I'm satisfied with how they look. To keep things simple, I'm just going to use the same materials for the axle, neck, and other detail objects. After creating the material and adjusting its settings, I can just choose it in the material drop-down menu when selecting other objects like the cylinder, the torso, or the axle. For the eye, I'll select all the relevant faces using Alt-click to select connected face loops to make my life easier. Then I'll add a new material by clicking the plus sign on the right of the material list to add a new material slot, and then I'll press new material to create a new material for the eye. I'll go down to the emission section of the material and turn up the emissiveness to make it a glowing material, then press assign to assign that new material to the selected faces. And now with materials assigned, we're done. We only used cubes, cylinders, loop cuts, extrusions, insets, and bevels. The only modifiers we used were the mirror and bevel modifiers. And if you follow along step by step, pausing and rewinding a bit along the way, as a beginner, this will probably take you less than 20 minutes, assuming you've paid attention to the crash course and familiarized yourself with moving around in 3D. Of course, if you did follow along and are comfortable with all the operations used to make this robot, I encourage you to try and add more detail. Adding new objects like more cubes or more cylinders in strategic locations as well as beveling some edges can go a long way in making it look a lot cooler. Now, some of you who followed me along modeling this little robot might feel a bit underwhelmed with the final result. Keep in mind, I never got into material nodes, lighting, and rendering, which is a whole separate skill set to 3D modeling and it would require another video or two to cover. Lighting and rendering can drastically alter how you perceive 3D models. With good lighting and rendering, even the simple robot we made can look pretty decent. Also, keep in mind, the techniques used to make this robot is the foundation for basic hard surface modeling. You can continue to use these simple techniques at a smaller scale to add screws, gears, and other details. With just a little more time adding more extrusions and shapes, and some good textures and materials which I won't be getting into in this video, this simple robot can turn into a somewhat professional looking asset. So if you followed along making this little bot, be proud of what you've made. Don't get discouraged because you can only make some simple shapes for now. If you keep practicing and learning, you'll eventually be able to create anything you can imagine in 3D and share it with the world. You just have to get started and start modeling stuff. Just practice. If you hit a wall or don't know how to do something, just Google it. Once you've grasped how to navigate Blender's interface and how to start modeling in 3D, I suggest watching Ian Hubert's mini tutorials for more useful tips. If you want a more thorough and formal introduction into Blender, watch Blender Guru's stuff, especially his donut and chair tutorials. Again, this is meant as a crash course into Blender. This video is not meant to teach you how to become an amateur 3D modeler overnight. That being said, I hope this video has encouraged you to continue modeling if you've ever tried to pick up Blender but felt like giving up. This video was initially meant to be a quick Blender Crash course or a refresher for those wanting to follow along for any future tutorials that I'll be making, which will require an intermediate to advanced understanding of Blender. Of course, this video turned out to be way more jam-packed and comprehensive than I initially planned, but oh well, this is the video. Anyway, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. I'll be posting a tutorial on how I made this transforming duck in a few days. Thanks.